Welcome to debugging and optimizing WebGL applications. Uh, this will be kind of a roller coaster uh, talk with a whole bunch of stuff in it. Uh, do not try to take notes. The slides are available. Uh, you can get them from the Kronos WebGL website uh, or the WebGL samples repository on Google Code. Uh, I'm Ben Vanek. I'm an engineer at Google. And this is Ken Russell, also an engineer at Google. And uh, so. This thing hasn't been sticking to my shirt very well. So um, by way of uh, introduction, where, where does WebGL stand today? The first version of the spec was released at GDC 2011 back in March, and it was, a, it was pretty exciting. And at this point, WebGL is actually enabled by default in Firefox, Chrome, and in the uh, forthcoming Opera 12 release. And Safari uh, 5.1 contains a developer menu option to turn it on. Uh, the, the next version of the WebGL spec is coming pretty soon, and the main uh, changes in the spec are Titan security. It turned out that there were some implications of uh, being able to use cross-domain images that actually weren't okay in the context of WebGL, so this has been tightened up already in the spec and in implementations. Um, the corner case behavior has been very well understood and, uh, and clarified, and some new limits have been introduced for maximum portability and compatibility. But primarily, the, the conformance suite has been improved. And what's good here is um, this actually means that browsers can pass the conformance tests. And they can claim that they support WebGL. So you can do get context of WebGL as opposed to get context of experimental WebGL. So basically, WebGL is coming out of experimental. And uh, we think that that's exciting. So as a developer, what are some of the pros and cons of using WebGL? So some of the pros include that WebGL directly exposes the GPU's capabilities to JavaScript. And this means that you're going to get basically consistent performance characteristics across browsers. And this actually goes in contrast to what Richard pointed out earlier. But generally speaking, it, it should be the case that you should understand the, uh, the performance criteria of the browser pretty well, and it should be pretty consistent across browsers. Um, you get complete GPU accelerated control over each pixel's appearance. And this is cool because you can write pretty complex fragment shaders that do awesome lighting effects. And these are running on the graphics processor, so instead of running, say, in JavaScript. Um, geometry batching, the ability to draw lots of triangles at once in one draw call, gives you the opportunity for very high performance. And WebGL is not a plugin. It's an integral part of the HTML developing experience, and it integrates cleanly with other web content. So these are some of the reasons why you might want to choose WebGL as the rendering technology for your game. Now, what are some of the cons of using it? It's much lower level than the DOM or Canvas 2D APIs. It is harder to learn, it's harder to debug, and it's harder to optimize. But that's why we're here today, to try to help you along. So if you want to really understand the GPU, this can't be an introductory talk. There's just too much to, to discuss. A GPU is a stream processor, and it, it you know, operates on streams of vertex data that flow down from JavaScript and then, uh, or in, in the case of WebGL, and then it flows into the fragment pipeline where lots of pixels are processed on the way to the screen. The programming model is very different than when you're programming a CPU. So here are a few resources. Again, these, are, these slides are on the web already, so the links are live, and, uh, and you can go through and study these at your leisure. So WebGL is pretty cool, but some issues. Sometimes the performance doesn't match that of native OpenGL, but it should be close. Sometimes the performance doesn't actually match that of Canvas, but in general, it should be a lot better, because again, you can send down lots of triangles at once. And sometimes things just don't work, because as Barbie says, graphics is hard. So with that, how do, how do you debug WebGL code? The common question is, why doesn't my program render? You've got no output on the screen and no JavaScript errors on the console. Now what? Okay. There are many common reasons for this happening. Pretty much every time I personally write OpenGL code or WebGL code, this happens. And so how, how, does, how does one uh, debug this? Well, OpenGL errors might be preventing your rendering completely. But these don't get reported as JavaScript errors by default. And we'll discuss a little bit how to get that to happen. Maybe your virtual camera is pointing in the wrong direction. This is much easier, a much easier problem to have in 3D because you have an entire like, direction that the camera might be pointing as opposed to in a 2D canvas where the most that can happen is the things are like scrolled off the screen. Maybe you forgot to bind the texture or buffer when you were uploading data or you forgot to bind it when you were trying to use it. Um, maybe you forgot to enable vertex attributes as arrays. That, that happened to me in the last um, major 
like new set of WebGL code that I wrote. Um, a lot of other reasons, or my own personal favorite in the context of the web, a typo in your JavaScript caused the value undefined to be passed into various WebGL API calls so that they weren't actually doing what you expected. Uh, has this ever happened to anybody here? All right, good. So um, there, there are ways to, uh, to track down what's going on here. So when you're faced with a blank screen, don't panic. The first thing that you should do is check for OpenGL errors, and we're going to discuss how to do that in a minute. You, sometimes it's actually helpful to restart with a known good base. I mean, I, I personally went back to the Nihi tutorial and got like a spinning uh, square on the screen. I was like, all right, that's working. Why isn't my square, which has a, a radically different vertex and fragment shader, showing up? Turned out that I forgot to enable uh, vertex attribute arrays. Oops. Um, and then once you actually have something on the screen, add code back in iteratively toward your current goal. And of course, these are very generic techniques, and we're going to show some much more advanced tools of how to, uh, that, that can help you debug your applications more, uh, more better. Now, when you're debugging a shader, this is harder. Generally speaking, what you want to do is remove functionality until you're back to something that works. And you have to be careful that as you're taking out functionality, certain vertex attributes may become unused, and that may make later OpenGL calls in your program invalid. So you really have to be careful when you're debugging shaders. But the most useful technique that I've personally found is output red or some other constant color in the regions of the shader where you're trying to identify what's going on. And once you've seen them on the screen and you know where they are, then you can begin to add back in the actual lighting functionality that you're after. And there are plenty of libraries and tools available to help you triage these issues. So webgldebug.js, this is linked from the, uh, the Chrono site, and uh, Greg Tavares, who's in attendance, is actually the author of this. Um, this wraps a GL context and checks for errors after each call. And the error output goes to the console, and you can change it to throw an exception if you want to see immediately here's where the OpenGL error occurred. Um, it's also useful for simulating context loss and restore events. Um, the Firefox web console lets you also turn on, uh, in a built-in fashion, OpenGL uh, error checking. If you have to call the get error method directly, just be aware that OpenGL errors are batched up. So you may have several errors pending, and you have to actually call GL get error in a loop to make sure that the error state is clear, and then do the draw call that you're concerned about checking, and then check the error state again. Um, going back to the context lost issue, there are many reasons why the WebGL context might disappear out from under you. And a couple of the most important ones are maybe the browser might drop the WebGL context if your tab goes into the background because it's trying to save resources. Or maybe the browser is noticing that actually there's a lot of low GP resources in general and just decides to spontaneously drop the context. So you need to be prepared for these, these events and know how to respond to them. And webgldebug.js can uh, simulate these events and help you make your apps more robust. So uh, please see Greg's article on handling lost context on the Kronos Wiki. Now, I would like to uh, hand the stage over to Ben Vanek, who is the author of the WebGL Inspector for the meat of the presentation. Thank you. So the WebGL Inspector is a little open source Chrome extension that I wrote a little while ago, uh, basically trying to replicate the functionality of offline tools such as PIX and GDebugger uh, for the WebGL world. It allows a whole bunch of, of different debugging stuff, uh, but the easiest way to kind of get into that is to show it. Uh, so here's a demo. This is Greg's awesome WebGL Aquarium, uh, which you can see pretty fish kind of moving around. Uh, it's one of the classic WebGL demos. Uh, and on top of it here, I've got the WebGL inspector. Uh, when you start it up, the inspector's empty. Uh, while you're running your application at any time, you can capture a frame. So basically go through and capture all WebGL calls made during that frame and replicate it for you. Uh, and just to kind of make things easier, I will pause that. Okay. So basically now we've captured a frame, it's replayed it, and you can see it down in the corner. Uh, we have all of the calls that were made, a couple thousand of them, uh, and can do some fun things. So because this is a frame, we can actually step through uh, all of the draw calls made and see the scene be reconstructed. Uh, it's kind of a fun way to see how you're drawing things in the order you're doing them in. Um, can kind of see uh, in yellow uh, redundant calls. So those are calls that were made but didn't actually change any meaningful state. Uh, so for example, um, with all of these uniform values uh, that you can see here, the values were already set to those. Uh, 
so basically the JavaScript was making a bunch of WebGL calls that didn't actually need to be made. Um, you can remove those for, for better performance. Um, there's some fun features. So as you're trying to do debugging, so why isn't something rendering? Uh, if you find the draw call in the stream, uh, you can isolate that draw call. So this being a demo may or may not actually display anything as I'm isolating these. Um, let's find something interesting. Uh, you can click on a pixel. And if you click on a pixel in the result, it'll actually show you the history of that individual pixel. Uh, it's very similar to a feature that's in Pix. Uh, so we can see here that for that pixel that I clicked on, that was a pillar, uh, all the different values, all the draw calls that contributed to that pixel, including ones that were ignored because they didn't path, pass the depth buffer. Uh, for the pillar, this is likely it. Uh, so clicking on one of those draw calls should take us to that in the trace. Uh, now we can see if we isolate that, that that was in fact the pillar. Uh, and we can actually get more information about that call. Uh, so here's a ni nice little pop-up that shows the geometry. So there's our pillar, kind of, if you can see that. Um, it shows all of the uniforms and sampler state that were set for the program while it was drawing it. Uh, all of the vertex attributes and all the rest of the state uh, that was used to do the draw. Uh, so this is very useful if you find a draw call that isn't drawing correctly. Uh, or just want to actually see how you're drawing your scene. Uh, if you have textures that you're interested in, all of them are clickable, so you can kind of cross-reference, and there's, uh, for example, the pillar texture. Uh, we can see the URL that it was sourced from, as well as any other information about its mode. Uh, we have, can also see all the other textures that were created and uploaded in this program. Uh, so, have a nice little browser here. Uh, so this is another way, if you're having trouble seeing things on the screen, so if, say, for example, there was no red fish drawing, uh, we could find the red fish texture, uh, click on that, uh, and we see that there was one bind texture call in this frame that actually used it. So we can go to that bind texture call, and in all likelihood, the next draw call after that was actually drawing that fish. And so click on the info, there's our fish. Um, so you can use this. To, to both diagnose the issues that you're having as you're debugging your application, uh, or just check for optimization opportunities. Uh, for example, looking through the call stream here, there's a lot of uh, things that the cover in the slides that um, you can optimize. So that's basically WebGL Inspector. Um, it's a Chrome extension, runs in the modern versions. You can go and get it uh, from the website. And it's all open source if you want to hack around on it. So now the crazy deluge of slides. Uh, GPU optimization is a game of whack-a-mole. Uh, fixing one performance problem will likely yield another performance problem. Uh, it's merely that the one you fixed was masking another one. Uh, GPUs are massively complex, uh, and there's many layers between your code and the GPU itself. There might be a browser, there might be a, an intermediate browser layer, in the case of Chrome, the, the render backend. There's user mode drivers, kernel mode drivers, uh, on Windows, there's things like Angle that are getting, getting in the middle of things. Um, there's generally no one-size-fits-all solution because of that. Uh, every domain and every scenario will have a different set of optimizations, and, and some might actually hurt performance more than they help. The trick is to test often and test repeatedly with real applications. Uh, it's very tempting to go to jsperf.com and write a little WebGL micro-benchmark, but it's really not going to tell you much of anything. Uh, except for maybe API overhead. Uh, you need to test it in your application, and you need to keep your performance consistent. Um, there's nothing worse than reading a postmortem of a game where someone comes in at the very end and says, you know, we missed our perf numbers, and we had to spend several weeks going back and trying to squeeze out percentage points from, from everywhere. Uh, if you follow kind of the principled uh, optimization guidelines from the beginning, you never really have to worry about that. You always come in under your budget. Um, so the number one rule, if you get nothing but this, that would be great. Reduce the number of draw calls per frame. Generally means batch as much as possible. Uh, batch your state, batch your textures, batch your programs, batch everything. Um, and we'll get into the more of that in a second. Uh, but generally, if you're in WebGL Inspector and you see a lot of draw calls coming up in your frames, more than you expected, that's a good first place to start. Uh, you want to use request animation frame. I'm sure most of you have, have already experienced this with 2D Canvas, uh, but just make sure you're using it. Uh, it can be tempting to kind of hide set intervals down under the covers, but request animation frame will get you a lot of good behavior for your user uh, in terms of power control and, and better browser management, um, but also will ensure a more stable frame rate. Uh, 
avoid any, any API in WebGL that begins with get or read. Uh, these generally cause flushes of the GPU, and in certain browsers, such as Chrome, may even block the rendering process while that, that is processing. Uh, it's a very quick way to have your frame rate. Um, and also get error, as an example of a git, will do that too. Uh, the WebGL debug JS layer that Ken mentioned earlier uh, uses git error. And so if you leave that on, you can drastically impact your performance, and it's kind of easy to miss. So if you're going to do performance testing, always make sure that it's off first and don't ship anything with it. Um, you want to avoid redundant calls. As I mentioned, in the best case, they're just additional JavaScript overhead. Uh, maybe the browser's being smart enough, maybe the driver's being smart enough not to really do anything with the GPU. But in the worst case, they're flushing all your state and you're losing, losing cycles for no reason. Uh, and you can use the WebGL inspector if you capture your frames, just look for the yellow and try to get rid of it. Uh, it's important to note that uh, in um, WebGL, state is uh, consistent across frames. Uh, which means that if you disable depth testing on one frame, you don't need to disable it the next frame. Uh, there's a lot of code that normally in the beginning of a frame will set a whole bunch of state, and none of that's really required. You want to disable unused GL features. Uh, if you're not blending, then don't blend. It doesn't mean you want to disable them every other draw call as you're going between translucent and opaque textures, but generally, if you're not using something, you shouldn't have it enabled. You want to link your programs infrequently. Linking is really expensive, especially on Windows when it's going through Angle. Uh, I would generally say try to link all of your programs at the start of your application when you've got your user kind of out of the experience, uh, because it's almost guaranteed you will drop frames if you try to do it at runtime. Uh, also, there's an interesting note here at the bottom. Uh, a lot of mobile development, if you've done any iOS development uh, or Android development on GL, uh, we'll recommend instead of switching frame buffers, reattach render buffers to frame buffers. Uh, in WebGL, you generally do not want to do that, as there's a lot of security stuff required to do validation, and attaching frame, uh, rem render buffers to frame buffers is often significantly more expensive than just swapping the frame buffers. So if you're going through some things, make sure you keep that in mind. This is one of my favorite slides of all time, stolen uh, graciously from the GPU Gems uh, book. The book is entirely available on the NVIDIA website, but I recommend getting a hard copy because it's great. Uh, and chapter 28 is this really great chapter that has a whole bunch of uh, really good guidelines, some of which are covered in this, this deck, uh, for how to diagnose performance problems in graphics applications uh, and how to fix them. And this is a slide that they use. It's a really great flow chart for how to go through uh, and identify which parts of your program are actually causing the slow bits, whether it's the GPU or CPU, and what GPU uh, processes you're going through that are actually causing issues. Um, it's important to note that GPU Gems, the first, first volume, came out a very long time ago. Uh, so there is some stuff in there that's not necessarily true but uh, anymore. Uh, but in general, it, it, it's still a pretty good read. Uh, just real quickly, some of the stuff that, that's interesting here uh, that's easy to, to test. Um, if you don't need to, uh, disable alpha when you create your WebGL context. So when you call git context, you can pass additional attributes set alpha to false. Uh, that'll help the browser do better compositing uh, and hopefully get you better performance. Uh, and then kind of going down to the middle bit, there's the very resolution. Uh, I have a really fantastically ugly demo uh, of this. Uh, so in the case of slow frame rate, like say this guy, this beautiful white cube, uh, this white cube has got a really expensive fragment shader. So in this fragment shader, it's computing 15,000 different additions uh, just to get a kind of synthetic slow, slowness here. Um, you can see we're running at nine frames a second. And if I was looking at a complex scene, say I had uh, lots of really expensive lighting calculations and normal maps and all that kind of stuff, uh, it might be difficult to identify what exactly is going wrong? Am I GPU bound in geometry? Am I drawing too many things? Am I skinning bound? Am I uploading too much stuff? Um, but a really easy way to identify if you're fragment shader bound uh, is to just change the size of your viewport. Uh, so this little demo, uh, which I recommend adding to, to all your applications, lets you adjust the size of the viewport really quickly. Uh, so changing it to 64 by 64, to 256, et cetera. Uh, and you can see if we're at kind of the native resolution of 500 by 500, we run really slow. But as soon as we reduce this down, we get 60 frames a second. And it's the basic principle of there's fewer pixels to fill on the screen. Uh, and generally, that identifies uh, applications that are fragment bound. 
So if you can and you're, you're running into frame rate problems and you drop this, you know your fragment shaders are too expensive uh, or you're not exploiting the depth buffer properly, which I'll get to in a second. So to start off with, I'll talk just a little bit about uh, how you draw your scenes. Uh, it actually really matters in WebGL. Uh, in Canvas, it's common to use the painter's algorithm just because you have to. Uh, if you want to composite a simple scene, you have to draw in the order that the things are presented on the screen. Normally that means you sort by z-index and you draw each object. Uh, in WebGL, however, that's probably the worst way to draw. Uh, generally, you want to sort by state and then by depth. And you can get away with this by using the depth buffer. So in this example here, uh, the, the two blue squares are kind of sorted together and batched. Uh, and they're composited on the screen in the same order as the painter's algorithm using the depth buffer. Uh, so depth buffers, uh, if you're not familiar with them, are kind of magic. They basically per pixel can sort uh, fragments as they're presented on the screen. Uh, and they do this by basically writing in for each fragment that's processed uh, the depth on the screen that it is, and then the next time a fragment goes to be written there, it tests it, and if it's behind, it ignores it. Uh, and what this means is that for a relatively cheap um, uh, amount of GPU work here, uh, you get the ability to discard fragments that won't be viewed. So in this example here, all of the bits in this back, backmost blue triangle, if this was drawn in the right order, uh, would never actually be drawn if they were occluded by the red triangle. Uh, if you're going back to really expensive fragment shaders, uh, this can actually be a big win. I have another really ugly demo for this. Uh, so in this example, there's 10 of those really expensive cubes with really expensive shaders. Uh, and you see if they are all running really expensive, we get really horrible frame rate. Uh, they're all rendering on top of each other right now. Every single fragment's getting processed. Uh, but if we turn depth testing on, we see that all of a sudden the frame rate goes, well, slightly better. Um, and it's because only one of the cubes is actually getting its fragments processed, and all the rest, besides the one that I have errors with Z-fighting there, um, are not. Uh, so make sure you've got your depth testing turned on, you've got your depth buffer turned on, and you're using it, even if you're in a two-dimensional application. Uh, it allows you to get richer fragment shaders and, and do much more interesting stuff. Uh, when you go to sort by state, you generally want to sort by the most expensive state to change uh, down the hierarchy. So generally changing the frame buffer or changing any uh, WebGL rendering context modes uh, will be the most expensive work you can do. Uh, it'll cause the GPU to flush. It might require a lot of work under the covers for validation. Uh, you want to do it very infrequently. So that's if you're doing render to texture operations, you're changing blend modes, et cetera. Following that, uh, changing programs and changing bound arrays is fairly expensive. Uh, the GPU has to reconfigure itself. It might have to, to validate programs again, validate arrays. Uh, you want to be, be very careful about doing that. Uh, that means that if you're drawing 1,000 objects, you, ideally, you would batch them together such that they would be sharing uh, few arrays as opposed to changing a thousand arrays a frame. Uh, and finally, you can change uniforms. Uniforms are relatively cheap to change. They're not free. You want to try to get as much geometry as possible processed with the same set of uniforms. Uh, but changing uniform, you should do much more frequently than a frame buffer. Uh, if possible, uh, it, you should be keeping your scene in a sorted order by this uh, kind of state hierarchy uh, that might be separate from the, the hierarchy your objects are normally contained in. You might have quad trees, oct trees, stuff like that for doing hit testing and uh, physics calculations and such. Uh, but when it comes to actually rendering, a flat list of objects that you can easily sort and batch on is often worth the additional memory uh, in bookkeeping. Uh, batching textures, so similar to how you'd batch textures normally with standard atlases and, and such, uh, you want to do here. Uh, WebGL, unlike if you're using a sprite sheet in Canvas, it gives you the, the network performance benefits of only having to download a single image, uh, et cetera. Uh, in WebGL, because now of the ability to do this batching, atlasing also gives you uh, that additional state, state sort. Um, always make sure to mipmap, uh, especially if you're going to be scaling to different sizes. So if you're drawing all your sprites at their native resolution, you probably won't get too much benefit. But as soon as you start scaling things smaller or larger, having mip mapping really helps. Uh, also, if you're generating atlases, keep them at a reasonable size and beware that some GL implementations have very small texture limits compared to desktop. Uh, 
So if you're thinking of doing 8,000 by 8,000 or 16 by 16,000, some devices are 2048 by 2048. So just beware, you can query that with GL get parameter. Generally, just because I've never found a pretty little diagram like this, I wanted to throw this in here. Uh, the structure of a frame when using depth buffers will be that you wanna draw all your opaque objects front to back. That allows the depth buffer to get uh, kind of the, the best benefit out of uh, removing things that are occluded. Uh, and then you wanna draw translucent objects back to front uh, and kind of change the modes so that, that they work. You can go look at this. Uh, one trick that can be helpful, especially if you are finding yourself very fragment bound uh, and in a scene where you can't cleanly separate objects by opaque and translucent uh, or sort your translucent objects, is to perform a de depth pass. Uh, so this generally means doing a single pass of your scene uh, using identity fragment shaders. So just drawing white, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but basically you're priming a depth buffer. And then after you're done with that, you go back and you draw all the colored uh, with your full normal shaders on top of that using the, the depth buffer that you just generated. So basically you're guaranteeing that no fragments will be processed that don't need to be. Uh, it can often save you if you're trying to sort a lot of objects on the GPU or on the CPU, which in JavaScript, depending on your, your uh, scenario, might actually be more expensive than, than doing this. Uh, note that you do have to use the invariant keyword in GLSL. Uh, some systems will work just fine if you don't. Uh, but you will notice very interesting issues on others. So just make sure you're, you're using that. And to sorting of uh, your geometry, uh, there is this interesting trick. Uh, when you call GL draw arrays or GL draw elements, the order of the triangles in the arrays that you're drawing are, is the guaranteed order of them uh, processed and rasterized to the screen. Which means that if you're drawing a whole bunch of translucent objects, if you draw them in the order they're supposed to actually be, uh, they will appear that way. Uh, and you can use this to, to great benefit if you can afford the CPU sorting um, to get really efficient translucent drawing. And you can see the links at the bottom for more information on that. Okay, so that was basically organizing your scene and, and how you kind of draw everything. Uh, geometry is kind of the first part of the pipeline as you're trying to get vertices in. Uh, and there's some, some high level rules. Generally, you wanna draw as little as possible to get the best possible effect. Uh, if you can reduce the number of vertices, if you can reduce the size of vertices, uh, either by reducing the number of components you use, the, the format of those vertices, whether they're bytes or shorts or floats or whatever, um, you'll save yourself a lot of trouble. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of really interesting rules around this. And I think I link, so the iOS programming guide uh, has some really good rules uh, and really great diagrams, better than, than mine here, uh, on how to ensure proper alignment and ordering of your, your vertex buffers. Uh, Make sure to use index buffers. Uh, there are GPU features that are only enabled if you're using index buffers, uh, also element array buffers in, in, in GLand, um, such as caches for post-transform vertices and such. Um, it might be tempting to draw just a bunch of triangles uh, if you're doing a 2D sprite engine, uh, but if you can, uh, use, use index buffers. And you can, especially when doing a 2D sprite engine, you can get away with a lot of tricks such as reusing the same uh, index buffers for different sets of vertex buffers because you're just drawing quads. Uh, and if you're doing dynamic uh, sprites uh, such that you're up updating the data every frame, uh, you can up upload less data by being able to share the vertices. Uh, just some more on that. Uh, generally, you'll see all the performance guidelines say interleave your arrays all the time. And generally, that's a very good idea. I just told you to do that. Um, but Sometimes, if you're doing lots of dynamic uploads, it can be best to split out the bits that you're updating more frequently from the ones that you are updating less frequently. Uh, so in this case, say we're updating a large batch of sprites, uh, and we're just moving them around, but we're not changing the color of the texture, we might split out position from those other attributes. Uh, it basically allows for the minimal possible data upload. Uh, there might be a little bit more time spent on the GPU reconstructing the vertices, but it might balance out. Thank you, Google Docs. Um, so this particular slide is warning, I think, about not modifying index buffers. Uh, if you dynamically change index buffers in WebGL, it does require validation, and that is expensive, so don't do that. Uh, so once you've got the vertices, you get to shaders. Uh, this is where you start to get fragment bound, and most people run into their first issues. It's relatively rare that people get, get the vertex, uh, get vertex bound. Uh, 
So there's a couple questions to ask yourself and a couple things to do. First, you want to compute infrequently. If it doesn't need to be computed, don't compute it. Uh, this might mean putting constants in your shaders. Uh, so I've seen a lot of people who will break out Excel and generate a whole bunch of tables of data uh, and code those right into their shaders as opposed to, to computing the values in them. Uh, it might mean uh, taking values that are not considered constant uh, and making them constant if you can get away with it, and there's, there's some tricks to that. You generally want to compute early, uh, so kind of this nice little pyramid of expense. Uh, doing something once per draw or 10,000 times for each vertex or a million times for each fragment, uh, it's pretty clear where you want to put your math. Uh, so if it's possible, for example, to do a, a matrix multiply on the CPU instead of in your vertex shader, you generally want to do that. Doing one uniform update will be much cheaper than doing potentially tens of thousands of, of mul matrix multiplies. Uh, and if you can move something from your fragment shader to your vertex shader and use the GPU's interpolation, you definitely want to do that because you could end up with millions of fragments doing the same exact math. Uh, and if you can, compute inexactly. Uh, fudge the numbers, whatever works is, is what you should get away with. That means lowering precision, um, using faked math if you can get away with it. There's a whole bunch of great books out there for doing floating point math in interesting ways instead of calling kind of the built-in functions. Uh, and you also want to do level of detail uh, on your shaders. Chances are if something's four by four pixels in the distance, it doesn't need a full lighting calculation. Uh, that would be an example of where you'd want to change program. Make sure, again, that you're using MIT maps. Uh, there's a memory hit for them, but it's often almost always worth it. Uh, you gain both the quality improvement because you get trilinear filtering, and you gain a performance improvement because there's less for the GPU to do when it's sampling a texture. Uh, load only the resolutions you need. Lots of demos right now for a WebGL running on desktop on a 30-inch display. You load really big textures. Uh, loading really big textures on a mobile device or a netbook or something like that is generally bad. Uh, so make sure to use what you need, detect your capabilities, and go with that. Uh, Yes. So dependent reads are fun. Uh, dependent reads and fragment shaders are basically where you look up into one tex texture to then get a value that you use to look up into another texture. Uh, lots of fun tricks use this kind of stuff. But beware, because it is very expensive. Uh, on a modern desktop GPU, you might not feel it, but on older, older GPUs, you definitely will. If you absolutely have to do a dependent read and there's no way around it, make sure to schedule it just as you would in a computer architecture class from, from college by shoving as much math as possible between your dependent reads. Um, you don't want the GPU sitting completely idle waiting for, for texture samples. There's a cool trick uh, in the WebGL Aquarium and some other demos. Uh, if you are fill rate bound, so if you, for example, in that the fancy spinning cube demo I had, uh, if you find your frame rate increases as you drop your viewport size, uh, you can get away with scaling your canvas smaller, uh, setting the width and height on the canvas, essentially changing the viewport, uh, and then using CSS to set the width and height higher. You're basically using the browser compositor to draw the canvas at a larger size than it really is, and the browser compositor will use bilinear filtering for you, and it won't look too bad as long as you don't get too small. Uh, it basically gets you a whole bunch of free fill rate. Uh, and so finally, this is kind of uh, a fun little bit about data flow. Uh, some of the more advanced demos that are now starting to come out uh, are starting to hit on some of these things. In general, the GPU is a very deeply pipelined architecture. Uh, and if you're doing all the stuff that was mentioned earlier about properly batching your state and, and not flushing the GPU too much, uh, you're pretty good. But you can run into issues when you start to get into uh, some of the more advanced scenarios. Uh, in general, you want to read and write as little as possible to the GPU. Uh, read pixels is expensive for various reasons, uh, many reasons. Uh, and any uploads, so like a buffer data or a text image 2D, is also very expensive. Uh, so when you're uploading, you want to throttle. So there's many different command buffers that exist between your application and the actual GPU. Uh, for example, Chrome has one inside of itself before it then goes down potentially to direct 3D on Windows, before then it goes down to the driver, before then it goes to the GPU. Uh, and if you're trying to push many megabytes of data every single frame, you're going to end up stalling the command buffer while it waits to be flushed. Uh, generally, you should try not to upload so much a frame. If you need to, try to throttle it out, spread it across multiple frames. And it really doesn't matter how many items you upload, how many buffers you upload, how many textures you upload. It's really about the size. Uh, so for example, a, a 1024 by 1024 texture 
uh, you know, is a lot worse than one 256 by 256 texture. Um, so here are some fun slides that uh, you might not be able to get all through. Uh, but basically, you want to follow the principles of data dependency uh, and doing things like read after write. Uh, so for example, here in this top one, there's an upload and then immediately a draw using that upload. Uh, and that might require some latency on the GPU or in the stack leading to the GPU uh, before that draw can actually be executed. And you're basically wasting time on the GPU or other layers of the system. Instead, you should do what's at the bottom here, which is you upload, in this case, purple, uh, and then you do some other draws of other completely different data, uh, and then you draw as far away as possible. So this might mean uploading your data at the beginning of the frame and then using it near the end of the frame. Uh, it'll basically ensure that the GPUs never stall waiting for your data to get there. Uh, it sometimes can seem non-intuitive and it can kind of mess up really elegant code, but it's, it's often worth it to separate uh, by as many calls as possible. Uh, if you can, and you have the memory to do so, uh, double and triple buffer. Uh, this gives you a whole bunch of benefits in terms of uh, being able to more cleanly separate dynamic uploads if you're uploading data every frame and needing to draw it. Uh, and also allows you to do tricks like if your CPU can't keep up with your GPU, which can be common, uh, it allows the GPU to reuse old data. So say for example, I'm every single frame uplo uploading um, a new texture atlas, uh, and one frame I just can't get it because it was a garbage collection uh, on the CPU, the GPU the next frame can use the old, old atlas and still present a frame to the user. Uh, and you can do a whole bunch of fun tricks here. Uh, there is a demo that is not as flashy as I wanted it to be, um, which is, uh, this is a render to texture operation, rendering the scene to a texture and then putting that texture on the cube. And it's really difficult to tell, I'll update the demo, but they are actually completely synchronized. So the cube that's inside of the cube uh, is in the exact same position every frame, even though it's being rendered a frame earlier. And so by clever adjustment of your timestamps, uh, you can actually get some neat effects. Uh, and if I have one more demo. This will be going up at some point soon. Uh, it needs a lot of work. So if any of you are familiar with Rage or id Tech 5, uh, the trick that Carmack's been using for a while now of mega textures and sparse virtual texturing, uh, this is a very old demo I got working last night that shows the same effect in WebGL. So this is basically on the fly determining what tiles need to be displayed on these uh, meshes uh, uploading those to a texture atlas and then using that texture atlas, using the concepts of read back from the GPU, uh, proper data flow, et cetera. So you can see as we go through, we essentially have, I don't know, 20-some levels of resolution on here, which for last night, this was real imagery of the Earth, uh, and you could actually get gigabytes of textures on these without ever having to ship those assets, load them dynamically, and never run out of memory. Um, so I'll be putting this demo up on the WebGL repository with some more information explaining it. Um, but it kind of shows when you do, do data flow right, you can kind of get some cool stuff that is generally the, the territory of desktop applications right now. Uh, and here's an example of that readback that's being performed there. Uh, it's double buffering the frame buffer such that it's reading the previous frame's results. And I'll hopefully get more information on that. So, that was a lot of stuff in those slides. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, the slides will be up, so you guys can get them and go through them. Uh, GPUs, like I said, really complex uh, and really tricky to extract the maximum performance, and there's a lot of optimizations out there. The trick is finding the right optimization for your task when you need it. Uh, and hopefully, at some point in the future, you will be coming back to these slides when you need it. Um, in general, you want to start simple, test, and debug. Like Ken said, something doesn't work, fall back, get it working, and move forward. Add incrementally, and always keep it running. The worst thing in graphics is spending a day with nothing drawing. Uh, and if there's any feedback on WebGL, the tools, the APIs, uh, kind of the, the ecosystem, browser support, et cetera, please use the mailing list. Uh, the way stuff gets done is by the feedback from you guys, uh, real users. Um, Again, here's the link uh, at the bottom to the slides, and they're also up on the, the Kronos repository. That's it.
Also, Ken is the working group chair of WebGL, so if you have any questions or gripes, come up and Yes, I, I will take any and all <laughs> complaints about WebGL. No or complaints? Wow. <laughs> lack of support thereof or anything. Ah, good questions. Hi, I guess one of the questions is um, kind of can you talk about timing for WebGL in terms of a broad customer base? I mean, one of the things that was frustrating this summer was seeing um, one of the browser manufacturers saying we don't like security issues on WebGL. Do you think some of the new stuff you're seeing is is going to fix that? When, when, when am I going to be able to deliver a game on WebGL and feel that uh, most of my customers have access to it, like a mass market game? So this is a really good question. Um, in the working group, we've been specifically focused on security and robustness and trying to make sure that um, rogue content can't lock up your web browser or your machine. We've been investing a lot of time in the WebGL working group and in other Kronos working groups like the OpenGL and the OpenGL ES working groups. And the, the GPU vendors have been doing really good work in making their drivers more robust. They'll, like, they'll time out and give a notification up to the application level saying, sorry, this shader ran too long. And now we're finally paying attention to that in WebGL implementations and shutting down that content saying, sorry, this content locked up the web page. It can't run anymore. Or asking the user, this content might have locked up the web page. We're not 100% sure. So I think that when those robustness issues have been well resolved on the desktop, um, and are then you know, trickling down into mobile devices, that you'll see more uh, browser vendors be comfortable with turning on WebGL by default and you know, enabling it for all websites. And if you look at it, the, the majority of the GPUs that are out there today in both desktop and mobile hardware are capable of running WebGL content. So I think it's, it's more a matter of robustness and uh, browser sort of acceptance to getting this, these features in front of the end user. So do you have any dates? Do you, I mean, if you were, if you were going to, you know, put a bet on a bet business, on, yeah. yeah, where would you, where would you say a good ship date would be? I mean, you can ship today in the Chrome Web Store. You know, you could uh, put a, a WebGL game on the Chrome Web Store and it'll, it'll run on a significant percentage of machines. Now, I don't know what that percentage is personally, but um, you can begin to bet on it now, I think, and you can already begin to get, you know, adoption and I think monetization, although I, I'm not the right person to talk to about that. You should talk to some of the, you know, the DevRel people that are here in the audience. Okay, thanks. Yeah, sure. There's also the opportunity to use WebGL uh, as for progressive enhancement. So if you've got a Canvas game, you can use WebGL to get better performance out of it, potentially add more effects, where if the user can run it and it runs great, uh, then they get it, but otherwise they still have a fallback to Canvas. Uh, I have a question in regards to uh, WebGL on mobile and maybe thoughts on battery life and how it impacts the battery life. I think with request animation frame, it's fairly similar to native performance. You've got the extra overhead of JavaScript uh, compared to whatever native code you'd be running. Uh, but in general, it'd, it'd be the same uh, as a native application. Yeah, and in terms of battery life, I mean, there's no doubt that using you know, the GPU or if there are two GPUs in the system using the discrete GPU, which is what WebGL is going to prefer to run on, um, does drain the battery more than just the integrated chip. But more browser functionality is already beginning to use the GPU, like you know, compositing and, and accelerated Canvas implementations. They're going to try to go for, for high power so that you can draw more sprites and stuff. So. Um, Request animation frames is probably the best advice. You know, slow it down to the point where the browser is driving the compositing and the animation. Yeah. Uh, is there anything uh, for a secondary display? Like, you you have a phone and you might be having some animation running on that, and my need might be to show something on a secondary display. So it might be HDMI out or TV out. So does WebGL gives that facility to talk with the secondary display and do some optimization out there? Not inherently. The browser is responsible for the display of all the content on the screen. Um, WebGL, th there have been some discussions about, for example, uh, stereo, you know, wanting to actually have that viewport in your web page be real, you know, stereoscopic 3D. And the, the API will have to be enhanced to support something like that. But today, right now, it's rendering into the canvas. So if the browser supports some notion of, okay, you know, open this window and put it on the secondary display, then WebGL could take advantage of it. But right now, the browser's in charge of the display of all the bits of the screen. Thank you. Yeah. So I think we're out of time, but we'll be happy to chat more afterward and hope to see you at the rest of the conference. Thanks.